Hello, and welcome to another Ahead of the Curve show. This week, I've got my guest, Andrew Lazaro, on the show with me. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for doing this to keep things you know, going through this time. Absolutely. I think it was the least I could do to try and kind of inspire inspire what's kind of happening and bring some really interesting content and information and have some really uh, fun conversations with a lot of really talented people that are you know, currently strapped at home or at a home office somewhere, somewhere around the world. Uh, still yes, I'm now. Trying to figure things out. Yeah, so my, my wife and I live in Manhattan and we were there for almost all of it. And then be between you know the density of living there and apartment life and we have a dog that we were walking every day. So finally we sort of went, we need a break from this. So we're in the Midwest now. So I'm at my parents' place in Ohio. Oh, what part of Ohio? Cincinnati. Oh yeah, you know what? I think we had this conversation once before. I lived up in Fairfield for a very short yeah. period of time when I first immigrated into the United States. Yeah. No, it's it's nice to be back and sort of instantly as soon as we hit the Midwest. We were in Indiana together for a bit with her family as well. And like the weight just instantly, you know, came off of us and just being able to be outside. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I could just imagine what it's like for people that are kind of cooped up in some of those smaller apartments, you know, typical kind of New York, Manhattan, Manhattan little lofts or little, you know, those little uh, compact apartments. It's got to be got to be kind of uh, testing, to say the very least. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it was really nice where, you know, so you sort of know this before I, I started working at ESI Design, I was working a lot in theater and dance and opera and live performance. So I was used to the work from home setup. So we, our apartment was set up for that sort of already. And we found a great balance instantly with that. So it, it wasn't that cramped inside. We just missed the ability to go outside without um, feeling like you're playing Frogger outside, sort of <laughs> always trying to weave on the sidewalk with a little dog. Somebody's coming, move over to the other side of the road. Exactly. Keep yep. going, somebody else, keep going. Yeah, kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> So can you give us a little bit of a background about yourself? Tell us kind of where you're from, uh, how you got started and what you do for ESI? Yeah, um, so so I, I'm from Cincinnati as, as we sort of covered, I'm back at my parents' place now. And I, I fell in love with theater through high school and near the end of high school and, and taught myself sort of film editing at, at that time as well. So, so I was playing a little bit with video and, and doing a lot of live performance. Early on, I thought I was going to be an actor, um, as, as many people who end up working in the theater do. And, well, and I ended up doing- pants. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is my on-camera moment. Um, and, and I ended up doing this, this amazing sort of hybrid program that the University of Cincinnati CCM's theater program offered where even though I was in high school, I was doing a conservatory acting program as well. Um, and and the, the head of that program was the first person who said, you know, you're, you're too in your head to be an actor. You might be a director, but you're probably gonna be a designer. And I, you know, stubbornly dismissed it at the moment. Um, I went mm -hmm. to college in the as first we, As years. we all do in, in high school. Exactly, you think you know everything when you're 17 and 18. Um, and, and it turned out he was right when, when I went to college, I went to Williams College in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, which was an amazing school, an incredible art history program and fine art program, um, but also a great theater program. And there's an amazing summer theater festival up there. So you got this like mix of practical experience with liberal arts training, with you know traditional theater training. And um, one of my roommates at the time, Alex Matthews, he was really interested in film and I was really interested in theater. And I, I was directing this play called the gross called Gross Indecency about the three trials of Oscar Wilde, and um, it it was entirely based on actual transcripts. So it was a documentary theater piece, but from the past. It was the same director and team who did the Laramie Project, if you know that show. Yeah. Um, so so they took court transcripts and Oscar Wilde's De Profundis and quotes from his plays, and you know. Uh, uh, Lord Douglas, um, you know, his his lover at the time, who sort of the trials were over, and the Marquess of Queensbury, and all of these different bio biographies and quotes, and assembled a play out of that. And I was really interested in the German director, Bertolt Brecht, at the time. He sort of, one of his main theories was, if you know what's coming, 
you're not going to be impacted emotionally when the scene happens. So you can think more critically at the time. And, and, you know, Oscar Wilde, what he went to trial for was, it was called the gross indecency law, which was originally built up to be about statutory issues, but it's really, they prosecuted him for being a homosexual and that as an identity wasn't even really a thing at the time. So, so it, it really was this landmark watershed case. And, you know, at that time, gay rights and civil rights was at a very different place. You know, it was before the Supreme Court came out with landmark rulings over the last five years. So all, all to say, we sort of made this this political piece with, you know, in your programs, I wanted to put letters to your state legislatures to try to get things on the books at the time. Um, and, and my roommate was like, you know, why don't you project quotes from the play on the wall in that sort of direct way you keep talking about so that people know that everything is quotes and it's attributed to them. And before act one, you tell them, you give them an outline through these quotes floating across the theater of, of what would be in act one. And you do that for act two. I thought, oh, that's a really cool idea. And, and he was taking an animation class at the time. So I was like, why don't you do it? Um, <laughs> and, and the head of the theater program at the time, you know, it, it was one of those things where he was like, we don't have bright projectors. It'll never work. The walls of the theater are black. Our velvet curtain, you know, our show curtain is black. It'll never show up. So we did it in all white text and, and Barry Jenny Holzer asked, you know, scroll these quotes up across these 3D surfaces and, you know, not knowing about mapping at the time, it was just like, if it's distorted, it's distorted, but it became this really beautiful thing. And then fast forward a few years and, and my friend Alex and I switched, he became an actor working professionally and I sort of fell in love with video and projection design. So you guys flip flopped. We completely flip flopped. Um, and then, I worked in New York a little bit, um, assisting this director, Sam Gold, who, uh, absurdly brilliant director. He did the musical Fun Home um, and, and many other amazing plays. He works a lot with Annie Baker, the Pulitzer winning, prize winning playwright. And one of his shows had video design in it. Um, and they, they had a hard time figuring out how to make video work with the actors on stage. And it was like, oh, I speak actor fluently and I speak video fluently, so I can help get this to work. <laughs> and that sort of became my entry into video design professionally. I ended up moving to Seattle for a bit where I co-founded a theater company and really, you know, it, it was like a safe, perfect, artistic, supportive community to figure out how this thing kind of worked. And then the things I wanted to do that, that needed to be real time, responsive and reactive and interactive at that point, Everyone who I talked to, you know, again, sort of like when I was in college said, that's not possible in the thing that you're saying. And I was like, no, but like, it's gotta be. Um, and one of my best friends, uh, his name is Monty Taylor, sort of recommended, he was like, you know, if you like figured out how to code a little bit, you could just make the things work. So I went to grad school at NYU at ITP um, and figured out, you know, all these different ways of thinking about interactivity and what it is with storytelling and art there. And then I graduated um, and, and ended up working in New York theater, starting off Broadway. Um, my first off Broadway show was with this director, Daniel Fish, who again, like brilliant storyteller who every show he comes in figuring out how to tell stories differently. And it's all rooted in what are we trying to evoke at this moment or at this moment? So I learned a lot working with him. I ended up working with Michael Mayer off Broadway and then on Broadway doing a Broadway play and a Broadway musical. Um, and then uh, through, through a mix of conversations with my wife about you know, how, to, how to do what we do with different audiences and, and think about it in a different scale, I came across ESI Design where a friend worked and reached out there um, and sort of found you know, theater, which I will always love, has to a degree a self-selecting audience and what ESI Design does we're, in, we're a media architecture studio and an experience design studio. And so when you do something that, you know, is permanent in Hudson Yards, or we did um, with, with Float 4 when you were there, at the Statue of Liberty Museum, when you do projects like that, that thousands of people go to every day from all across the world, you sort of get this like amazing feeling of how you can use these things to change people's expectations. So now I'm very much in love with media architecture as well. Just this idea of how do you reach different people and change what they think is possible in a given moment. Um, so at ESI, I'm a systems designer and technologist and then a creative director on certain projects as well. So on some projects, I'm sort of overseeing all of the design choices and what the story we're telling is and what the visual aesthetic is and what the approach is. And on others, I'm 
more of the system designers specking, you know, what the display technology is, what the backend technology is, the network infrastructure and things like that. I think it's really interesting, you know, coming from a theatrical background, because I too come from a theatrical background, and it's just been such a wonderful place to be able to experiment with different things. And it's much more, I find much more forgiving actually. Yes. Than, than kind of the world that we work in now when you're working yeah. in architecture and you're working in permanent design, you can do mock-ups and that kind of thing, but you don't get the same, the same trial and error periods, I guess you do, or the, that, that senses of exploration that you can within the theater environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in the theater environment, you're in the room together. And, and I was lucky enough to work with directors who wanted designers in the rehearsal room early as well. So not that we'd have our full system and set up and display technologies, but I'd have a monitor or sometimes even a large TV or a projector in the room. And we would play with how this thing starts to interact and breathe so that you're not just doing mock-ups, you're like doing mock-ups and actual end user testing all at the same time. And if it doesn't work, you know, in in theater, you get this great process of, you know, you do rehearsals, then you do your tech, which is sort of your typical production load in. And then you get your preview period where you're rehearsing during the day, trying new things, and then you get to put it in front of an audience at night, sit down with your creative team and take notes about what worked, what didn't work and what you want to change and show up the next morning. And that, 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 interaction and that ability to iterate, as you said, and that idea, I talk a lot about this idea of the serendipity of chance, where like a thing might happen by accident one night, and then you have no idea that that, that interaction would happen, and then that turns out to actually be your golden nugget. And, and theater has, you know, over millennia found its process to, to optimize that workflow. And what I love about ESI is they're open enough to say, you know, there's myself, um, Aaron Parsikian is a colleague who comes from a theater background, and Matthew Haustel, um, who is a lighting programmer and a video programmer and a systems designer, is is at ESI permanently as well. So that we're we're infiltrating the workflow there as well. So we're finding little ways to try to put that in where we can. I'd love to actually hear from the viewers too, especially those creatives that are on on the, or watching watching presently what you guys are doing for mock-ups and what you guys are doing, you know, as a creative process for trial and error in that experimentation phase, it would be really neat to kind of hear some uh, comments from you guys as to what you're doing for mock-ups, whether it's inside of a studio, maybe it's even inside your home or inside of a, a, an open space or a venue space. So it'd be really interesting to hear that. And on that note, what do you guys typically do, Andrew, inside of VSI when it comes to mock-ups and, you know, creating these environments and these moments for the installations that you're working on? Yeah, it, it depends. So so when possible, we always like to have mock-ups living in the office with us. Um, you know, and we try to do one-to-one -one testing and then scaled testing. So um, Matt, Matt Household for this this project we're working on and our physical designer, Han, you know, they, they built a, a small scale model like in theater, a model box and took a small Pico projector right, and Matt, yeah. you know, Taking yeah, map, mapped it, ex exactly. Mapped it, you know, all to, I think he did it in quarter inch scale, maybe even eighth inch scale, because it was actually quite small. But we learned a lot about flow through the space that way. And at the same time, um, Han, our physical designer, our architect, and Matt, um, and, and our creative technologist, Mary, also did a full scale when you walked in our office with an ultra short throw projector, like an actual one-to-one -one size test as well. So we, we like to balance the two. When it's possible, we like to host it in our office. That way we can iterate and do rapid changes in real time. Um, mm -hmm. One of my first projects was in, in Times Square, the Barclays headquarters building at 49th and 7th Avenue. And, and for that, we actually flew to South Dakota where Dactronics who manufactured the LED was because the only way we could actually get a sense of how media played in real, real scale was to go to, to their production facilities in South Dakota and measure out exactly where you'd be on the sidewalk across the street and look at what that view was. So uh, an, another project we did was, was Major League Baseball's headquarters where we had this amazing, amazing display solution where there's a lot of light wood throughout the space. And so we took a wood veneer that matched that wood exactly to the eye and worked with Cubic Malt B to, and, and uh, four wall to basically manufacture 
LEDs embedded behind what looks like wooden slats that mimic what's in the architecture. So when the display is off, it's just wooden slats. And when the displays are on, it just glows from behind, you know, slow motion footage of baseball players doing various things. So for that, I think we mocked up like an eighth piece of that at Maltby shop in, in went to New Jersey and first tested it there with four wall, gave a few notes and then had it sent to our office. That's pretty, pretty remarkable. And I know that yeah. <clears throat> it's a, it's, it's pretty, interesting on how a lot of these concepts kind of come to life, but you still have to actually see them in their practical sense and Absolutely. see them at their full scale to basically really get a feeling of what it's going to look like, how that experience is going to feel um, when you're in that space. And it's something I think that also gets overlooked um, a lot in a lot of cases, but sometimes it kind of has to be because I know coming as well from doing a lot of live events, you know, you don't have the time to really build a mock-up. You've just got to yeah. look at it, look at it in your design software or, or look at it on your plot and go, okay, like I've done all of my legwork. I've done everything I can. Let's see if this is gonna actually work and kind of keep your fingers crossed, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. And there's great, you know, you guys at Seven Cents, Float4 had it, um, Disguise has it. The, the, the 3D previs tools that exist today, you know, were, were incomprehensible to me 10 years ago. So, you know, the, the other side of mockups is what previs tools do you have? And, and what, what's amazing about where media servers are heading right now is you can do previs with the actual software and system you'll be using in the end, which I think, you know, is, is incredible because then your previs actually is accurate to what you'll be doing and your workflow isn't redundant to build that. And a lot of these platforms now use it in VR. So in the work from home world, you can get as, as close to a sense of what it would be in you know the actual real environment is as you can from your laptop or with goggles on. I think the the struggle and the thing I'd love to hear from the audience as well is with all of those tools, like to to what degree is scaling different or to what you know like like I've yet to find a VR mock-up where the distance actually feels real to what it's like when I'm there. You know what I mean? And and you can't yeah. quite simulate crowds and and what people are doing as well to, to take those feelings into effect. That's a good point actually to bring up. And um, I think maybe Chet Miller might be a good person to <laughs> ask that question to who is watching. Hey Chet. Um, but it, you, you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, you see that as well in a lot of these different virtual events that are happening and virtual production um, or virtual concerts that are starting to appear. And yeah. I think that that relative area of space, especially when a, within a VR environment, kind of gets out of, a little bit out of proportion and a little bit out of like, well, reality, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And that, in this moment, it's kind of a beautiful thing because, you know, one of the beautiful things I think is, is finding ways in this moment for us to feel still present, you know, feel present with other people and feel seen. And the more that you're in your environment, the more that you feel that. And so, speaking to other senses beyond the visual, you know, like approximately 25% of how we experience the world is our eyes, but so much of the design world only is thinking about visual design in these moments in the sound design, you know, and, and I'm curious to see how it, how it pans out, but the almost Dolby Atmos or spatialized sound, you know, that Apple has said they're releasing in the firmware updates for these headphones and other headphones manufacturers and how spatialized sound is gonna start playing in in this moment, I think. You know, it's it's this thing that has always been a tool we've wanted to play, and we figured it out when we're all in the same room how to hit spatialized audio or you know narrow field beams of audio and things like that. But but the spatialized audio in the headphone space that's responding to where you are without me needing to put sensors, optical sensors, in some way around me, I think is a really fascinating new space. I think so as well. I, I absolutely think so. Chet mentioned he's found VR super helpful. Um, or oh, not super helpful. Sorry, not super helpful for me. Uh, Previs in the three D scene and use of images, videos from that, but VR is still a bit too mysterious for directors I work with. They get stuck on that rather than the art I want to talk about. Need a few more years of getting comfortable with it. And yeah, I think that's more of an adaptation kind of kind of thing that's happening today. Yeah, 
I also want to give a quick shout out to, to Chet as well. The training videos you've been putting up or that he's been putting up if you haven't checked them out. Even if you're not going to be a programmer, just thinking about what, what new tools are open, I'd say check out his videos. Um, but also that point, so, so there's this project which, you know, we're, we're still in an early stage of development on this project I've been working on called Ready, Set, Go. And, and one of the things really is figuring out that previs tool of not just showing what the, what the video or projection design would be in the end, but how that interplays with acting or movement and choreography in real time. Um, and, and how to visualize that in the rehearsal room and in a 3D previs state is, is one of the things we've been looking a lot at and that's sort of the main thing we're trying to solve. And, and it's still too early to sort of say publicly all, all of how we're solving that, but, but I think it is a really interesting question of how do you try to bring together outside of traditional AR ways of visualizing things in 3D space on a screen and in physical space? Um, yeah. and, and as Chet so, sort of said exactly, I've also found directors, if I'm showing them a 3D previs tool, they get stuck on, on what that tool is rather than the conversation that, that you're trying to have or on the VR exactly like you said, not representing space completely accurately enough for them to feel like they're in it. And then it, it almost becomes a rabbit hole of you're sort of problem solving the wrong thing. Um, but for producers in the VR <laughs> world, those tools are amazing. Um, you know, the, the various projector studies you know, from, from Seven Cents to Disguise to Mapping Matters, wh whatever tool you use, mm -hmm. the, the ability to say to a project, to a producer, this is why I need five projectors, or this is why I need two projectors, or, you know, if you're gonna cut my budget, this is what it impacts and this is what the director wants, is, is an incredibly great tool on the theater side and on the, on the, you know, media production side for ESI design. It's an incredibly useful tool because it, when you're purchasing the LED for a long-term permanent install, for example, you know you can set in your your features that basically let you say this is what you know 0.9 pixel pitch would look like as best as we can pre-visit, and this is what 1.5 will look like, and this is what 2.5 will look like, and this is why it's worth that investment. Yeah, uh, I mean it's definitely being utilized. And I mean, that's one of the main reasons why I think pre-visualization tools were built as well in the first place was to basically show um, impact to change in design and how things are going to be impacted. But of course, how you're going to be able to put things together and how they're going to look ultimately with all these visualizations in place. And David Perkins actually mentioned, you know, about VR that uh, the absorption will probably also likely be generational, which I, I completely agree with, that some folks will be born with it. Um, you know, and it's, it's a kind of a, a brain exercise on, on how we wire our brains um, in being trained to basically be inside of a VR space. Speaking of David, actually, David's gonna be my guest on the show next week. Um, and he specializes a lot in uh, visualization and visualization tools. Uh, one of which he just released on Unreal Engine called uh, Carbon, which we'll be mm. talking about next week. That's amazing. So thanks for um, that comment, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you're exactly right. It, it, is a, it is a generational thing and it's what you're used to thing. And, and it becomes this like, you know, little, little dance of, you know, in, in the theater side, you know, people expect to see a change you know, instantly. Um, there's there's this great writer, Nell Benjamin um, and Larry O'Keefe. They're they're married and a writing team together. And uh, through through this basically teaching session that uh, my wife put together, they call it the Traveling Masters, and they take accomplished writers from across the industry, all across the United States, to give free free workshops. And one of the things they said in this one workshop, I sort of crashed, was uh, Nell defined talent as you know talent is is basically the ability to get your first idea out of your head into the world see where it works and where it doesn't work and then make that change you know see see what lands what doesn't and adjust or iterate and the faster that you can condense that time down that's what she thinks we call talent um and and so it becomes this little game of how much of that process do you share and how much of that do you not share publicly? And, and that I think 
you know, is the other interesting thing between theater, you know, if a director asks to see a change, it's like, okay, how quickly can I put up a thumbnail sketch of it to make sure you're happy with my idea? Or to what degree do I go, I'm gonna need an hour on this because we wanna get it to a certain place before I put it up publicly, which is very different from when you're doing a permanent long-term installation. Because if you make a change, you absolutely have to show it through the process to your client to get sign off at that point. Yeah, sign off and approvals. And you know that basically comes down to a workflow, kind of a workflow uh, question more than anything about uh, you know the changing of workflow from creating experiential spaces to permanent installation spaces to theater. Uh, they're all kind of have the same, a lot of the same crossover within the way that they work, but uh, very major differences in the way that they are, uh, I guess, pushed through or approved. Yeah, like that that expectations level setting element of the workflow. There's um, this amazing structural engineer, Peter Rice, um, who I've been reading a lot of again recently, um, who through, through my wife's extended family, we had a connection to as well. And he had this great line, you know, he, he worked with IMP and, you know, worked on the Sydney Opera House and, um, you know, what was a mentor to Zaha Hadid, for example. And this great line where he talked about, you know, eventually when people come to you for commissions, what they're coming to buy is surprise. And there's this amazing thing about that, that when, when people come to buy is surprise, he had no idea what he was going to give them either. And, and so there becomes this like fun, that if that's where the expectation game starts, which I think is a really beautiful place, then it becomes, you know, how do you level set the expectations throughout so that you're not taking them by surprise, but you're still giving them something that is surprising in the end and, and leading them along the way. And yeah, what, one of the biggest adjustments was the theater workflow process of that switching to, luckily I have great mentors at ESI to, to help me get a hang of it, um, but changing to that in terms of a long-term permanent built-in itself. So let's talk a little bit about some of the projects. Oh, thanks, Christy. Thanks for watching and thanks for all your support. So let's talk about uh, some of the projects that you've been working on and uh, kind of dig into some of the nitty gritties on some of the challenges that you've actually had in transforming some of these spaces and designing some of these spaces. So do you have any one in particular that you'd like to bring up uh, that you'd like to talk um, about? Yeah, let me try. Um... Let me do a quick screen share. So, you know, just just looking at immediately before the shutdown, um, one of ESI's newest projects was the the new headquarters for Warner Media in New York. Um, so, Warner Media is is a mix of Warner Brothers and HBO and Sesame Street and CNN and TBS and TNT and probably a whole list of other media companies and, and TV channels. Oh, I think Cartoon Network is them, definitely. Um, and so, you know, when you have this big umbrella, it was their first time bringing all of these divisions on the East Coast under one roof. And they, they moved into Hudson Yards as one of the first big offices when Hudson Yards opened. For those of you who aren't in New York, Hudson Yards is a new mega billionaire sort of feeling, <laughs> high-end <laughs> development on the west side of Midtown Manhattan. Um, and they're, you know, they're accessible at the first floor and then their real lobby is the 35th floor and then they own many floors in between. And so, so some of the challenges that ESI had to solve was, you know, giving them non-traditional displays so boxes that are not 16 by nine. Let me, let me screen share actually um, and show some of this. There we go. There we go. Okay, you can see that, right? Yep. Um, so this is what you see when you walk into the ground floor lobby. And as you can see, it's non-traditional displays. There are wraps around these columns. So coming from a theater background and, and ESI coming from a storytelling background, we always come from a, what is the experience for the audience? You know, who are they? What do we want them to feel and experience at given moments? So there's a beginning, a middle, a rising action and an end to every project we do and to try to think through every user journey throughout. Um, so we, we wanted to pull you in and give them a tool to say, this is what we're working on at this moment. So we, we opened this project with them, to their employees at the end of last year. So when the Joker had just came out and Game of Thrones was wrapping up, as you can see there, um, 
winter was definitely coming at the time. <laughs> and, and we wanted to figure out how do you transition between, you know, a DC property and an HBO property and then a TBS property. So we ended up calling it the streams. Um, and you can, I think my mouse is gonna show up here. Um, so on this very wide display, and, and we did it throughout here as well, and on the other sides of this column here, basically taking what was not a, a immediately apparent in that asset, taking the dominant colors in real time and making that fill the sides of the screen as well. So, you know, at, at ESI, we have a very open definition on what data vis visualizations are and what data vis means. And for people who animate and edit video, RGB values, color values, are yep. one of the main data points, right? So, so that's what we did. And this is what you saw when you got off the elevator on the 35th floor. Um, and then we built this interactive piece. Our software partner on this was Rare Volume. Um, and this was one of the modes where basically it would take, you know, what, what was relevant, what they had just premiered recently, and it would pull the script um, and, you know, the screenplay and help feature the writer's works and take these hotlines basically that would analyze what was happening on Twitter related to a certain show at that moment, relate it instantly to what was, you know, what scene that was in the script and basically make a data viz of that scene from the text in that script and then pull the clip that was closest to what they were referenced all accessible through uh, what we call near touch. So in in a great prediction, we we could take credit for, um, but in that sort of Coca-Cola, we're not that smart, we're not that stupid either, post Coke <laughs> 2 or new Coke moment. Um, this, this is not a touch screen LED, this is near touch. So using LiDAR, if you go about an inch away from the screen, it's it functions as multi-touch, it's all the user interactions you're used to, but you do not need to actually touch the surface. Um, and then this is sort what of- Was that like a rotary rotary laser multi-point touch device, kind of like an air scan? Uh, yeah, so, so it's, yeah, a, a mix of LiDAR sensors and Intel real sensors above um, yeah. that sort of calibrate together. Um, That's a this is a creative, really, really beautiful piece. Yeah, this, this I think is the crowning achievement. Um, we call it the prow and it's visible. There's a video where you can see what it looks like from the outside as well. But again, with that idea of real-time interactivity, there's, there's this sadly is a touch screen. Um, but you can see over here, the touch screen where you can basically pick a TV episode or a branding mode and hear the audio of an episode. And then the same idea of data viz being the RGB or the color values, it will extrapolate or abstract that moment of a TV show in real time in different ways up and across this this 3D sculpture that became our own struggle for how to breathe is. Um, and then as you walk out, you know, here you can see the column wrap again, and you'll see in the video, I'll show in a second, what that exit is, because we also always think about the exit, not just the entrance. I don't think we have audio on this one right now. Andy. Oh, great. Um, you don't need the <laughs> audio, just stock music. Um, so this is that stream and that transition as well. So that clips from different properties, even if their color values or their branding values are different, the streams became a sort of dynamic transition way to show that. And then this is that entrance in again, those streams so that you can bring content in and out in a branded way that brings everything together. But if you're seeing something from HBO on one side or TBS on the other, it's not gonna feel incongruent. This is just your branding mode again. Um, this is a series of planar flat screens where their CMS, their marketing comms teams just wanted to put out, you know, what was happening within the company at that point in time. This is as, as in a track mode as you walk by, the real senses are pulling up it, interacting with you so that you don't need to be told, hey, you can interact with this. And this is that prowl sculpture again. Yeah. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it's, it turned out really beautifully. It was built um, with Parallels, a shop in Brooklyn. And this is a branding mode where it can take a logo from one of their channels and float it in 3D across the space. Um, all custom fabricated, all custom software running it. And as I said, there's sort of a Fireflies mode or a streaming mode, the pixels can fly across. This is the, the Warner Media universe, just again through Twitter or you know, through all the different properties, you can use the touch to see how different properties or voices 
across all of Warner Media are linked. So I have to ask you from from Warner uh, Media, what was kind of what was what did they come to the table with to you guys to get this this project started? Did they come up with any? Did they have an idea of the concept that they wanted to do, the story they wanted to tell, or were, did they come to you? Yeah, guys I mean, they they had an idea. At, you know, at, at the time when they first approached ESI, they were still Time Warner. They were not Warner Media. So a major rebrand happened in the middle of the design of this project. <laughs> Let's um, throw a wrench into the whole mix. Yeah, but but the beauty of of doing things that are rendered in real time or near real time, you know, and and building your workflow that way is. When you get that wrench, you're you can adapt more easily. If all of this had to be completely pre-rendered, that would have been a nightmare situation. It would have undone months and and probably years of work and prep planning. But because so much of it, of it is done in real time engines, we we can adapt quickly and rapidly to that. Um, but but when they first came, so the the architect of record on this is Gensler, who was our partner on it as well, and. You know, they knew they wanted something in that staircase piece, for example, but when they first came to us, they thought, you know, oh, what if it was just LEDs embedded, you know, in the front of each step? You know, they, they knew they wanted visuals there, but they didn't know what. Um, and so when we saw that, that's when we were like, oh, you know, from a user experience standpoint, from an audience standpoint, you're not gonna be one of looking, want to look down as you're going up the steps to see the thing and you're not going to feel comfortable looking up at, like that's not a comfortable viewing experience so so as an example you know we we knew they wanted something in that space but we were able to sort of reset expectations and say rather than make it that let's make it the middle of the stairwell and if we do it in this stairwell where it's in the prow and we build it correctly it'll be viewable from street level and it will be viewable from people driving down 11th avenue and you know, that way, even from ESI's office, we have a clear shot. We're at Fifth Avenue and 18th, and we have a clear shot of Hudson Yards. Um, so it really is a beautiful thing at night, how clearly that sculpture ends up becoming part of the skyline. Yeah, I bet Warner Media right now are unbelievably happy with the result that they ended up getting from that. And, you know, whether that was a happy accident or whether that was an intentional plan, I don't. I couldn't see how a client wouldn't be <laughs> over the moon to have something with yeah. that kind of impact, especially in a high traffic or a high volume space. Exactly. I mean, you know, with with the shed across the street, which is a great new arts venue um, that that has been doing really interesting programming, and they have a fine art gallery in the shed as well. There's hotels in the area. I mean, it really, you know, the it is one of the most high end malls I've ever seen in the United States in that in that complex as well so it really is bringing in a lot of people and the fact that standing outside you can see the sculpture is a really beautiful thing and one of the things coming to esi that that i didn't have in my toolkit you know we're working in the live performance world were tools like revit and like rhino where you really can pre-visit the entire building and pre-visit through time of day so the ability to see that through endscape renderers and plugins like that Really, really, you know, I never in a million years would have thought about what this looks like from 11th Avenue. Um, <laughs> but through through those tools, you can. Yeah, the the incredible kind of times that we're in with the technology that we have today is just, it's, I'm very thankful for where we are technologically yes. because the advancements that we have and the way that we can do things and optimize things has been just a wonderful a wonderful experience, but at the same time, I think it's kind of you know a blessing and a curse at the same time because those expectations start to shift and change as well, yeah. Um, yeah. based on the tools that you now have to be able to achieve things. So, yeah, I think uh, yeah. you know there's a little bit of a, a paradigm shift in the way that things are being done, but also kind of a misunderstanding as well as to the amount of time that things still take to accomplish yes. and get done. Yeah, that was er, early in my career. That was one of the struggles where I tried to make a name being someone you called when something didn't work and, and someone who could work quickly. Um, and and Kevin, Kevin Adams, um, he was this absurdly brilliant lighting designer. Um, he I've worked with him on a few shows with Michael Mayer. He did, I, I believe he won a Tony for Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Um, he, he did everything from Hedwig and the Angry Inch to SpongeBob SquarePants the musical to, to give a sense of, of Kevin's work. Um, and he's, he's a brilliant artist and a gruff sort of personality. 
And, and one of the pieces of advice he gave to me early on was, you know, be, be fast, be good and be really fucking fast. And that's how you make it in this industry. Um, <laughs> and so, so I would really optimize my workflow as much as I could in that way and, and try to make a name for trying to be as quick and nimble on my feet as I could, um, you know, both with, with being fast so that I'm not the bottleneck when, when we're trying to get something fixed or come up with a new idea, but also to be responsive to what's happening and go, oh my God, someone, someone noticed this thing. Um, that, that new idea that someone came up with actually needs to change the entire act or this entire you know, approach to this thing. And, and again, as, as David points out, um, yeah, with real-time rendered, not real-time created, that's the perfect way to think about it. Real-time rendered lets you actually get it up there faster, but you still need the artist time to actually think about what the new idea is. Yeah. And setting that expectation with clients, whether it's in the theater or the media architecture space becomes this like, nuanced thing where you're still trying to promise we're faster, you know, we're, we're as fast as can be or faster than everybody else and trust us. We're not wasting your time. We'll get you something quick with, but, but we, we, we need time to give you a good choice, not a first choice. And I think that's sort of, I always go back to that thing now Benjamin said of what talent is and how quickly you get that idea out and how fast you can iterate to find the better choice. It's quality versus quantity. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so can you uh, give us a little kind of insight as to what one of the most challenging projects you've worked on has been to date? Oh man, I did um, my, my last Broadway musical that I worked on most recently, it, it was a little over two years ago now, Head Over Heels on Broadway. And you know, the, the technical challenge of it was we were, we were blending projectors across many different points of depth um, and a lot of the set, so, so to set up the show quickly, it was a new musical set to music by the band, the Go-Go's, you know, so mostly music from the 1980s based on a play written during Elizabethan England, um, based on a, a Greek poem. So ancient Greece with a little bit of Elizabethan to it with 80s rock music set to it. And, and it actually all really did come together through you know, a brilliant book writer and an adaptation team and Michael Mann's direction. It became this beautiful story really about the, the, the long history of you know, the, the right to demand acceptance for who you are in your core. And, and this story, even from ancient Greece, you know, involved you know, questions around race and questions around um, you know, non-binary gender representation and things like that. So it really was this incredibly beautiful piece to work on. But the challenge was we were trying to represent old theater techniques with new theatrical tools. So traditional scenic painting on drop cloths made up a lot of the scenic elements, which then to a, a lot of what we did was was using video as hyper precise lighting to trick the eye almost in a tremploy or optical illusion way. So if you walked out of the show thinking there was no video or only one song with video, I did my, my job really well because the video was on. Yeah, it was on through the entire performance except for literally 45 seconds, but meant to feel like it wasn't video. So it meant we had to like super specifically down to the millimeter projection map to things that were hand painted. So there was no previs that we could prep with, right? There was no accurate Photoshop file or, you know, template we could work on. It was hand painted. No 3D model. Exactly. Yeah. So we had to document it when it was hung in the space. Um, and we couldn't do it before that. Add to that um, that it was all fabric. So it would billow in the wind once you have a cast of 15 dancers doing okay. fast choreography. There was no way to, to lock it in space. So you had to basically figure out how to do real-time projection blending on something that was not sturdy, on something that you couldn't have a template for. And needless to say, NDI tools and earth magnets to root it into the floor when it came in was, was the best way that we could solve that. But it, that was the most difficult project, especially because it was all about, you know, how you, the, one of the theses of the show emotionally was, it's hard to see people for who they really are, or how you struggle when you're not seen for who you are. So that meant on the design side, we really had to make things not look like as they were at the beginning. It's such a detailed level that you couldn't tell what we were doing. And, and 
we were using the most cutting edge tools we could at the time, you know, and video over IP with NDI became essential to doing this. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was working with fabric and using binoculars and earth <laughs> magnets to click it into place. That's all of it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. Thank God for dynamic blending tools. How long ago exactly. was that? Exactly. Curiosity. How long? That was two years ago. Two years yeah, ago. Yeah. So, so it was before, I mean, you know, I think one show on Broadway, Chet is, if he's still watching, can probably keep me accurate. I, I think that Frozen had already opened. He's, which he's I a think, whole fact checker, by the way. Exactly. Um, and, and Frozen, I believe, was the first camera calibration show on Broadway. I might be wrong, but I think that, that that was the first one. So I think it had just opened before, but but our show for, for budget reasons, being a new musical without the backing of Disney, didn't have the budget to, to work with that system. So we were still doing it by eye at that point in time. <laughs> so Chet mentioned that they abandoned it, abandoned it during yeah. tech, actually. Yeah. So I guess it would have been the first show. Yeah, it was the first show to, to try it, I guess we can say. And I think that roots us back to what we were talking about earlier, about just the, the, the liberty of trial and error inside of the theater, which is an absolutely wonderful thing. Yeah, and, and because you're doing rentals, and if you build a long you know, relationship with your rental house, you can basically rent a piece of technology, and if it doesn't work, send it back. You don't have the same commitment of something that's specced and purchased through an integrator and installed in a permanent setup. You know, we. We couldn't at Warner Media or at Barclays or at, at MLB's headquarters, you know, suddenly go, oh, we spec the wrong LED. Can we swap this out for, you know, we spec 1.5. Can we swap this out for 0.9? Or, you know, Panasonic, I know we bought your 20K lumen projector, but, you know, we really we get the 50. 50. Exactly. <laughs> Well, Andrew, I wanted to thank you for, for coming on with me today. Um, for those of you viewing, we're going to go into more of a Q&A period, so I definitely encourage you to stick around. But for those of you who want to get a little more info on Andrew, uh, you can check out www.esidesign.com. Uh, and Andrew, do you have any, uh, personal, any personal information you wanted to share in order for viewers to get in touch with you? Yeah, if you go um, Andrew Lazaro, uh, I think it's just andrewlazaro.com. I, I'm bad at promoting myself. Um, <laughs> really good at promoting ESI. I'm really good at promoting my wife's nonprofit, the Dramatist Skilled Foundation. Um, I'm really good at promoting the work my family does, but but myself, I'm not great. But I, yeah, it's andrewlazaro.com um, shows my theatrical and freelance work. Awesome. So you can and reach then you can contact me directly. Andrewlazaro.com. Yes. Yeah, you can contact me directly through that website or through ESI. Fantastic. And next week, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, I've got my good friend David Perkins on the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about visualization, some of the things we were speaking about today, a lot of the advancements that are taking place inside of the visualization environments, and uh, basically rendering within real-time engines. So please come back and check out that episode next week. It promises to be an interesting one, to say the very least. And I know that some of the tools that David's been working on are, are definitely cutting edge and uh, there's a lot of interesting things to kind of show there uh, and potentials for stuff happening for the future. So we definitely want to open this up as well for Q&A. So those of you who are watching, thanks so much for being so supportive. If you guys do have any questions, um, as I always ask, please post them in the comments of the video and we'll get around to them um, as much as we possibly can. And I also wanted to just say a shout out to the Daily News. I saw the Daily News posted there, um, complimenting you, Andrew, on your work. So I wanted to make sure to acknowledge them as well. And yeah, so kind of kind of getting back into um, a little bit of the corporate side of the work and some of the, kind of the stuff that you're doing at ESI. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges that you had at Hudson, at the uh, Hudson Yards? Yeah, uh, on the, well, so, so one of the challenges to, to get a little boring into the nitty gritty is the the way that that building was structured, there were there was a hard division between different halves of the building in terms of networking, and those two networks like never crossed. Um, so so Warner Media's offices sort of CNN 
is on one side and then there's like another tower and a different set of elevators that you would take to get to HBO, for example. Um, so how to consolidate that on site was difficult. Um, we partnered with X2O for, for part of our CMS solution. So if they wanted to update assets through the entire building, literally every floor of their, their headquarters had multiple screens, each one that you could target individually or as groups. So, so getting that networking was a very difficult thing. Beyond that, different floors of the building had different integrator companies. Um, so if you work in the industry, you know what that means. If you don't work in the industry, think of it as a completely different install and engineering team you know, between floors 14 to 17 and then floors 17 to 25 was a different one. And then, so there were three that we worked with in getting all of that both to work together cohesively. And then even just remembering when you're on site, like who to call for what question, you know, if a thing was angled incorrectly or something wasn't installed correctly or you needed something adjusted or there was a networking problem or a signal flow problem, breaking that down by floor became a challenge. That sounds like it must have been somewhat of a nightmare. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. It was also, you know, thinking about that the logistics they... to go behind doing something like that, um, and those challenges are, are are often unforeseen. Again, you know, it's just Completely something you unforeseen. don't even think about. You're like, all right, we're just going to go and install this thing, and not realizing that okay, well, we got all this communication that has to happen, and now we've got three different basically companies that we have to work with yep. to make this all work cohesively. Yeah, I mean, and all of that, you know, so usually because it was also a new building, all of the construction delays stacked up and, and I feel like team video, whether it's in the theater or in permanent installs and architecture, we're always the last runner in the relay race and it's still up to us to win the race. So no matter how late we get the baton, we, we have no excuse in the end to, to not be on time. Um, and so they started doing phase move in as we were initially loading in, which meant there were eyes watching, um, which to I think a lot of companies would be really daunting that, you know, we had to do a temporary setup and just get, you know, through our backups content playing so that we had something going when they walked in. But for us, it was really lovely because then we could actually watch how people responded and used the space with our things and make our adjustments. It almost let us do the theater model of previews where we could actually see what people were doing while we were still finalizing our animations and our content and our programming. So we could basically tweak things in real time and, and see what the response would be. <laughs> sounds like, yeah, it sounds like uh, it, it, was, it was a challenge, but again, thank, thank God for some of the real time technologies that we have today because otherwise- Absolutely. Yeah, that it would be a lot more time consuming without a doubt. So my own personal last question to you is mm -hmm. M&Ms. Yeah. Do you prefer blue M&Ms, green M&Ms? Do you have a choice? I, yeah, I prefer green M&Ms. Um, green is my favorite color, so I'm always going to choose green. Um, <laughs> my candy weakness is Cadbury eggs, where I just think the, the irony of like, any time of the year, that's like my special little treat to myself. So, so that's if we're gonna get, you know, real about candy, that's where I would want to go as a special treat. But my, the, mine the, and minis, the mini eggs, you know, the little ones, the that come big, up, like, which, which, yeah, the the full size chocolate with the cream in it. Um, I, I don't know, I I don't know what it is, but but there's just like something to me. Normally something like that would be too sweet, but to me like that in a glass of milk is the perfect. Maybe it brings you back to your childhood. It might be related to some like, some, some yeah. that you might've had from when you were a kid. Yeah, I feel like one of these days, like a full session with my therapist will be like, okay, so being raised Jewish in Ohio, why do I love Cadbury eggs so much? And, and that could be at least a session, if not a whole month of work, I'm sure. It's interesting because we were talking a little bit um, in the pat with, with a, a group that was on last week, Falcon Group here in town. Uh, yeah. you know about about the idea of sparking these memories from your childhood and kind of creating these environments that bring back some essences of those in experiences that you have today, and how yeah. much you know how much um, these experiences kind of stay with you throughout the course of your entire life. And trying to create those, recreate some of those experiences, kind of in a more modern way, and yeah. uh, 
I, I always find it's interesting that we can just so simply go to something like candy and be able to relate. Yeah, I remember how that tasted. And I remember, you exactly. know, big league chew and having this huge, these huge cheeks full of bubble gum chewing away when I was in school and, you know, those yeah. little memories. So, Andrew, yeah, that, that element. Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that that element, I think, you know, and, and you spoke about it so perfectly last week with Falcon Group. That, that element of how do you put yourselves in your design work as well, you know, whether it's corporate, whether it's theater, whether it's a museum, like I, I, I believe that it is absolutely essential to always put those little, share, sharing little bits of yourself and all of your things, because that's what makes it real and authentic and what, what makes it distinguish from anybody else doing it is who you are. And I think, absolutely. you know, finding those things and those little details that you put in that only you or your closest friends would ever begin to pinpoint as being personal to you. But but we all feel that authenticity. And even if you don't recognize that thing means that to that person, you feel that it is personal and intimate and revealing. And that I think is what we all connect to. And I think that is a wonderful takeaway for everybody that's on the tail end of the show here. Be who you are. Don't worry about anything else. Put your own little touches into things. And, um, you know, be proud of what you do because the work that goes out is unique to us all. We don't want the same thing over and over again. And it all comes out of who you are as a person and who you are as a soul. So Andrew, thanks again so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Um, thanks to all the viewers who have come and joined us for the show today without your viewership and without your support. Um, I, I, I mean, as far as a show goes, I probably wouldn't be here, but it's been amazing, an amazing journey so far. And please tune in next week again uh, to join us with my good friend, David. And as I say every week, everyone, stay ahead of the curve. Thanks for watching. <laughs>